and thank you, Todd, for that incredibly kind introduction. I hope you can squeeze in there okay with your crutches. <laughs> Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. It, it's, uh, it, it's so kind of you all to, to come out. I understand the traffic was, was pretty bad on, on 95 there. Um, I've had a wonderful walk around uh, this extraordinary campus with Marguerite. I wanted to thank Marguerite especially and, and, and Fritz as well as Todd. Um, uh, they've all been incredibly welcoming. It's such a, a beautiful feeling just to walk around this campus. There's really special things going on. And, uh, it's funny, Todd mentioned uh, Judy Cotton, uh, my fellow Australian. Um, uh, walking around here it reminded me of one of the first times uh, that I, I spent with Judy uh, in New York. Um, uh, I remember her dragging me into the small space she was using at that time as a studio, and she said, come on, you've got to try this. You're just writing about art. You've got to try it. And she got me making encaustic works of art. Um, not that they were works of art, but she, she showed me how to do it. And it's something I'll never forget. Um, uh, I still have uh, the, the piece that I clumsily sort of tried to put together that day, but um, this is the thing that this place does, right? It's where things get made, when people experiment and uh, try all sorts of different things, but with, uh, with a full sort of knowledge of the history of what they're doing and the importance <coughs> of, of technique, and, and, and it's just, I love walking around, just that, that sort of 40 minutes or so with my group is very special. So it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. I'm expected, I realize, to talk about uh, these relationships. So I've decided, uh, before I came, that it might be fun just to focus on one in particular, and that's the one between Lucien Freud, Todd mentioned, um, uh, and Francis Bacon. Uh, partly because I felt um, those two artists are perhaps less well known than, than, than the others that I, I write about in my book. Uh, and also because I felt that it might speak to to this particular setting and, 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 and the students um, uh, who are studying here. So uh, let me pull this out. I hope you don't mind. Uh, and uh, uh, I have some images here as well that I'm sure you'll enjoy looking at when you get sick of looking at me. So Lucien Freud's portrait of, of Francis Bacon uh, was completed in 1952. Can everyone hear me okay, by the way? It's, yeah, fantastic. Uh, it was stolen from the Neue National Gallery in Berlin 36 years later. It hasn't been seen since. A uh, visitor to the Berlin Museum uh, was the first to notice and report the work's absence. Police tried to seal the building, but it was too late. The gallery's director and staff were horribly embarrassed. There had been no real security to speak of, and it had all really been too easy. A small reward was offered after ports and airports were alerted. Uh, a couple of tip-offs were pursued, but it was all to no avail. There was nothing about the theft to suggest the work of organized professionals, but nor was it necessarily the work of bungling amateurs. The thief had used a screwdriver to remove the picture from the wall, um, and no ransom demand ever materialized. One thing, however, was widely noted. Uh, when the picture was stolen, uh, the museum had been filled with students. Untrustworthy much, no. <laughs> uh, and in Germany at that time, uh, the subject of the painting, Francis Bacon, was much better known than Freud, uh, particularly among students and younger art lovers. He was known as one of the 20th century's most vivid personalities, uh, certainly 20th century art's most vivid personalities, and he had what uh, amounted almost to a cult following. Freud, on the other hand, at that time, was a stranger to most Germans, even art lovers. Only his family name, uh, he was the grandson, of course, of Sigmund Freud, uh, was familiar. <laughs> so perhaps it was one of the students who stole it, or several working together. When the art critic Robert Hughes uh, tried to console Freud with the thought that the theft was a, a perverse kind of compliment, someone had evidently loved his painting enough to steal it, Freud disagreed. I don't think so, he said. I think somebody out there really loves Francis. <laughs> the portrait was in Berlin for a retrospective of Freud's work organized by the British Council. Freud was 66 at the time, getting on, and yet this was the first big show of his work to be held outside Great Britain. Thirteen years later, the Tate, which owned the portrait and had lent it to Berlin, and this was around the time that I uh, met and got to know Freud in London, was gearing up for another major retrospective of Freud's work. By this time he was 79. He had a feeling that it might be the last major show devoted to his, uh, to his work during his lifetime. So naturally both he and the gallery uh, wanted the best possible sampling of his work. The portrait of Bacon, in a sense, was crucial. It was just a tiny thing, uh, a mere seven inches by five, in fact, about the size of a pocket paperback. Uh, so a lot smaller than you're seeing it here. And by the way, he uh, didn't 
want it to be reproduced in color. Obviously, in real life, it's in color. Um, but he stipulated that until it's recovered, um, uh, it should only be reproduced in black and white. Uh, he painted it on a small piece of copper while sitting knee to knee with Bacon over a three month period. It showed Bacon head on and from very close in. Everyone thought of him as a blur, Freud would later say. But he had a very specific face. I remember wanting to bring Bacon back out from behind the blur. The picture marked a vital breakthrough in Freud's early work, and as such, it established a continuity between that work and his later work. There was reason to think it might be possible. Under the German statute of limitations, a crime of this kind can't be prosecuted after 12 years. Mm -hmm. So the hope was that the thief or thieves, especially if they were students who had acted more or less on impulse, could be enticed into returning the painting without fear of penalty. A publicity campaign, a campaign was planned. Freud himself was uh, signed up. He designed a striking poster with wanted, let's see if we can get that up here, uh, <laughs> uh, wanted in bold lettering, uh, and stolen in smaller letters below. Uh, there was also, by the way, that's in the, his original design. It doesn't appear exactly in this way there. But there was also a generous reward, as you can see uh, in Deutschmark. 2,500 of these posters were plastered all over Berlin and widely reproduced in newspapers and magazines. Freud even put out a, an unchar uncharacteristically deferential statement to the press. Would the person who holds the painting kindly consider allowing me to show it in my exhibition next June? <laughs> all great paintings, you could say, have an aura which, which derives in part from their singularity. When the painting in question is a portrait, especially if it's a great portrait, its aura, its, its special quiddity, is enhanced by the singularity of the person depicted as well. So a stolen portrait can amount to a confusing kind of double loss. You can strive to orchestrate its return, but what exactly is it one wants to retrieve? Is it the painting or the person? Or perhaps the time during which it was painted? In his own portraiture, Lucien Freud, always seem determined to treat these two kinds of singularity as one. My idea of portraiture, he said, came from dissatisfaction with portraits that resembled people. I would wish my portraits to be of the people, not like them, not having a look of the sitter being them. It was almost as if he were determined to reenact the myth of Pygmalion, the mythical sculpture who, uh, of course, fell in love with the sculpture he carved. In any case, the poster, the media campaign, the polite plea, none of it had any effect. The tape retrospective went ahead without the portrait. But for many years, Freud kept the poster prominently at the entrance to his studio. It was the last thing he saw before entering each day to work. The stolen portrait, as you've seen, shows him from head on and from close in. His eyes, I keep wanting to hold this the other way around. Um, his, his eyes are cast down, though not to the floor. They have a pensive, far away look, a suggestion almost of inward retreat. It's a face that combines a kind of self-mourning with latent belligerence. Hughes describes the picture as having the silent intensity of a grenade in the millisecond before it goes off. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Freud went on to become famous for the fleshy amplitude of his pictures and for his use of thick, oily paint, uh, lavishly applied. But in 1952, when he painted Bacon, he specialised in surface tension. Working on a small scale, with very thin brushes, very fine brushes, he kept the paint as smooth as possible. No visible brush strokes. Control was paramount. So was an evenness of attention, fastidiously maintained across the entire surface of his pictures. Even so, the contrast in this portrait between the left and right sides of Bacon's face not, and it becomes more remarkable the longer you look at it. The right, his right, cast lightly in shadow, is a study in, in placidity. Over on the left, however, everything is slipping and sliding about. An S-shaped <coughs> lick of hair, you can count the strands almost, casts a dashing shadow on Bacon's brow. The whole left side of his mouth twists upwards, triggering a pouchy <coughs> swelling at the corner of his mouth. A sheen of sweat shines from that side of his nose. Even the left ear seems to convulse and squirm. Most striking of all, and it's really the engine that, that powers the whole portrait, 
is the way Bacon's left eyebrow extends its powerful arabesque into the furrow at the center of his forehead. It's a, it's a conceit that has nothing to do with realism, if you consider that term literally, but it animates the whole picture. So you could see why Freud, who usually claimed not to care about the whereabouts of his pictures, cared about this one and really wanted to get it back. As much as anything, it was a question of quality, but it's lost mattered, I think, to Freud for another more personal reason. Very simply, it represented the most important relationship in his career. Freud had first met Bacon when they were introduced by the older painter, Graham Sutherland. Bacon was 35, more than a decade Freud's senior. Uh, Bacon, who was in his early 30s, was <coughs> surging to life in these years. He later said that he'd been wracked by self-doubt, but he was producing paintings, including a breakthrough work uh, of a man in the, uh, in the shadow of an umbrella, uh, which was the first picture Freud saw in his studio that had already set him apart. Troubled and troubling works in which alert observers saw something almost reptilian stirring to life, full of menace. The two men, Freud and Bacon, soon began to see each other on a daily basis, a routine that lasted not just a week, but well over a decade. This is showing them, sorry about the very blurry picture, but a little, a little bit later, uh, a few years after the period I'm talking about. Uh, Freud, still in his early 20s, was living in a condemned building in Paddington. Uh, he was a mercurial young man, ardent and unpredictable, but attracted by danger. And to most people who encountered him, he was extremely attractive. His famous family had escaped Hitler's Germany, thanks to high-level intercessions, uh, in 1933. When he first arrived, speaking no English, Lucien kept largely to himself. Wild and secretive, he had a high-spirited, almost demonic side, and a fierce aversion to other people's expectations. He loved to draw. His drawings were cramped, fanciful, and childish. Their pressurized lines crisscrossing the canvas or, or the page like, like cracks in a stone wall. He had two brothers, but he was his mother's favorite, and he knew it. I like the anarchic idea of coming from nowhere, he once said, but I think that's probably because I had a very steady childhood. His family connection to the founder of psychoanalysis obviously enhanced his allure, especially during what was then the heyday of surrealism in Britain. But the effect Freud had on most people was not at all social, much less intellectual. It was visceral. The critic Lawrence Gowing recognized, and I quote, a coiled vigilance in him, a sharpness in which one could imagine venom. Bacon's childhood was different. Uh, born in 1909, he was the second of five children. His father, Eddie Bacon, was a retired army captain who ran the household along military lines. Francis spent uh, considerable stretches of his childhood with his maternal grandmother in another part of Ireland. But when living with his parents, and despite chronic and, and severe asthma, he was made to go pony riding at every opportunity. For days afterwards, he'd be bedridden and struggling for breath. Captain Bacon, it seems, uh, wanted to make a man of his sickly son, and so he regularly arranged for the grooms to, uh, that he employed to horse with him. Uh, Francis liked to trail these same grooms around, and in his early teens, he had his first sexual experiences with them. After his father caught him dressing up in women's clothes, uh, Bacon was cast out of the house. He ended up in London after stints in Paris and Berlin, and he set out on a short-lived career as an interior designer. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, Judy, you probably know a, a famous Australian uh, writer, won the Nobel Prize, Patrick White, actually owned a number of uh, Bacon's uh, early pieces of furniture, um, uh, which was odd for me to learn as an Australian living there, to think that, that these, these very unusual things, very rare, were, were there in Sydney. Um, Bacon lived with his old nanny, Jessie Lightfoot, uh, a woman who meant more to Bacon than his own distant mother. She spent much of the day meeting at the back of his studio, and slept at night on the kitchen table. She was very nearly blind, but in the broader sense, she looked out for Bacon. She helped him to cook, uh, and she was not above shoplifting if the situation called for it. She helped him organize roulette parties as well, which at the time were very much against the law. And she was also a gatekeeper for Bacon's love life. Using Francis Lightfoot as a pseudonym, Bacon placed ads offering his services as a gentleman's companion in the personal columns in the Times. When the replies came in, it was Nanny Lightfoot who made the selections based on financial criteria. 
One of these gentlemen was called Eric Hall, a, a high-powered businessman. He had a wife and family, but after years of staying intermittently with Bacon and his nanny, he eventually left them. The three members of this unlikely menage took a lease on the ground floor flat in the building at Cromwell Place. What went on there astonished him. Seemingly alone among British painters at the time, Bacon seemed to be snapping British modernism out of its complacent, literary, neo-romantic past and bringing it into line with a new world scarred by war and hollowed out by a sense of existential futility. Bacon himself must have been almost as astonished. For years, he'd been dabbling first with upscale modern, modern furniture design, as I said, and then with mediocre paintings in a, in a cubist and surrealist vein. It was only in 1944, the year before his first meeting with Freud, that he'd broken through to something strange and troubling, a painted triptych he called Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion. The figures in question were hideous, humped, hairless shapes with open mouths, bandaged or non-existent eyes, long necks and tapering legs. Bacon's imagination was responsive not just to the expected modernist stalwarts imported from the continent, but to a whole new image bank provided by photography and film. Ever since he'd seen Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin and Fritz Lang's Metropolis in Berlin and acquired a medical textbook illustrating diseases of the mouth with photographs, He'd been obsessed by the, the speed and discontinuity of these very modern media, the way they hinted at, at loss, disruption, and death. Freud was awed as much by Bacon's approach to his work as by the imagery he came up with. Bacon described his breakthrough work painting as a series of accidents mounting on top of each other. If anything ever does work in my case, he said elsewhere, it works from that moment when consciously I don't know what I'm doing. It's easy to imagine the electrifying effect this kind of talk must have had on Freud. His own work, for all its gnarly fascinations, was still naive. He'd been painting portraits and still lifes, prickly studies of asymmetrical objects all subjected to his intense, hawk-like scrutiny. His drawing was fastidious and stylized. The wandering, high-spirited gaucheness of his teenage years had been tamed. He favored careful cross-hatching and stippling in imitation of engraving techniques. Uh, his most powerful painting was a still life of a, of a dead bird, a heron splayed out on a flat surface. Every feather of its disheveled plumage accorded its own distinct shade of grey. These were wonderful works of art, but he was fascinated by uh, Bacon's risky theatrical approach, and also by his utter lack of sentimentality about his own efforts, which he would often destroy before they left the studio. I realized immediately, Freud said much later, that his work related immediately to how he felt about life. Mine, on the other hand, seemed very later. And just as important was Bacon's visceral love of oil paint. He handled paint with an urgency that uh, at this stage was entirely absent from Freud's own careful filling in between the lines. There was something, something chancy and erotic about it, and Freud was beguiled. But what affected him just as powerfully as Bacon's work was his attitude to life. He had an expansiveness, a generosity, a way of negotiating people and situations that came as a revelation to Freud. His work impressed me, he said, but his personality affected me. In Soho, where they usually met at night, Freud marveled at how Bacon gathered people around, deploying his charm, which seemed to have something volcanic and indiscriminate about it. Freud would later call him the wisest and wildest person he ever knew. Inevitably, their friendship aroused jealousy in Eric Hall, who came to loathe Freud. Uh, probably, Freud told me, because he thought wrongly that Francis had some kind of relationship with me. That's a quote. I'm not talking about me. <laughs> Freud's friend and early lover, Anne Dunn, would later claim that Freud, quote, had a kind of hero-worshipping crush on Bacon, though I don't think it was ever consummated. What's undeniable is that the relationship was not only intense, but asymmetrical at this stage. Bacon was attracted to Freud, but indifferent, or so Freud thought, to his work. Freud, on the other hand, for one of the only times in his life, was truly enthralled to another person. Influence is very difficult to lay out neatly, obviously. It has nothing clinical or rational about it. Freud was young, and he was surely susceptible. And yet, what seems clear is that even as he admitted Bacon's example, 
he now found himself caught up in a, a struggle to hold true to his own course. He registered immediately not only what he, what he was drawn to in Bacon, but what distinguished them, what was perhaps unbridgeable. Bacon, he later said, talked about uh, packing a lot of things into one single brushstroke, which amused and excited me, he said. And I knew it was a million miles from anything I could ever do. The pressure on Freud through these years is easy to imagine. Uh, for all the interest his work generated, nothing he was doing was in any way revolutionary. What Bacon was doing, or at least uh, it seemed this way, certainly was. His approach was really the complete antithesis of Freud's, where Freud labored over his portraits for weeks and months. Bacon's painting relied on stealth and surprise through a combination of chance and high emotion, uh, fury, frustration, despair. He saw himself unlocking what he called valves of sensation. He spoke of feelings of hopelessness, blurting out on one occasion that he would, quote, do almost anything to get out of the formula of making a kind of illustrative image. He would wipe the painting all over with a rag or throw turpentine and paint onto the canvas to try to break what he called the willed articulation of the image so that it would grow more spontaneously. Three decades later, when Bacon and Freud were no longer on speaking terms, Bacon told a friend, you know, the trouble with Lucian's work is that it's realistic without being real. If this dismissal was unjust in 1988 when Bacon said it, it may have struck closer to the bone in the 1940s and 50s, when Bacon wouldn't even have needed to say it. Freud probably felt accusations of backwardness, of timidity, of provincialism emanating from his friends as a kind of background hum. In 1946, uh, the war finally over, Freud went to Paris, where he was introduced to Pablo Picasso. And the following year, he met Kitty Garman. The young couple married and lived together in St. John's Wood, a half-hour walk, half walk away uh, from Freud's previous home in Delamere Terrace, where he now kept his studio. He began a series of portraits of Kitty, some in pastel, others in oil. Uh, coming within two years of Freud's first encounter with Bacon, they announced a new ambition in his work and a sudden intensification of feeling. They seem almost to quiver at times, generating and somehow containing a psychological pressure that was new in Freud's work. The pressure derives in part, you feel, uh, from the effort Freud was putting into not being blown off course by Bacon. At mid-century, Bacon had entered his most fertile, innovative period, where Freud spent weeks and months on a portrait. Bacon talked during these years about images being handed to him ready-made, dropping into his mind one after the other, like slides. He was enjoying his first public successes, too, attracting the attention of galleries, critics, and fellow artists. Uh, inspired by Velázquez, he was painting various variations of the Spaniard's famous portrait of Pope Innocent X. Uh, his ambition, he said, was to paint Velázquez, but with the, with the texture of a hippopotamus skin. <laughs> he became obsessed with open mouths, screams, snarls, both human and animal, uh, uh, and he returned to these motifs again and again. I like the glitter and color that comes from the mouth, he said, and I've always hoped in a sense to be able to paint the mouth like Monet painted the uh, sunset. Freud made three drawings uh, of Bacon, uh, thrust forward, and as you can see, his pants suggestively undone at the fly and uh, folded down to reveal uh, some of his belly. According to Freud, Bacon himself had adopted the pose, saying, I think you ought to do this because I think it's rather important down here. <laughs> Looking at these three sketches, you, you, can't, uh, you can feel something quite uncharacteristic entering Freud's manner. Uh, what stands out most, perhaps, is the, the swift swoop of his, his drawing arm as he tries to define the outlines of Bacon's flanks. There's something in, in each of these drawings that's not quite right about the results, but together the drawings generate a fascinating little microclimate of, of contending weather, sexual, artistic, and interpersonal. Emboldened by Freud's drawings of him with his pants open, Bacon asked Freud to pose for him in his studio. This painting turned out to be the first named portrait in, uh, in Bacon's oeuvre. And for this reason alone, it's significant. From the mid-1960s, uh, when his reputation was peaking, by far the majority of Bacon's paintings were portraits of a small number uh, of intimate friends, just as Freud's already were at this stage and would continue to be. What was unexpected about this first-named portrait 
uh, was that when Freud arrived, he found the painting of him already on the easel and almost finished. <laughs> it turned out that in lieu of Freud himself, Bacon had used a, a visual trigger uh, to help him, a photograph, as it happens, of a young Franz Kafka, um, used as a frontispiece to the first edition of Max Freud's biography of Kafka. What Kafka had to do with Freud is impossible to say, and perhaps not really the point. It was a question instead of unconscious, almost random suggestion. The portrait barely hints at the lavish distortions and ardent injuries Bacon would later inflict on his subjects, all in an attempt to convey what he liked to call the brutality of fact. What mattered was what it revealed about Bacon's attitude to his subjects, an attitude that, for now at least, was completely at odds with Freud's. Bacon was later very open about the fact that he found the actual presence of his sitters uh, in his studio distracting. He preferred to paint alone. This may be just my own neurotic sense, he later told Sylvester, but I find it less inhibiting to work from them through memory and their photographs than actually having them seated before me. The subject's presence inhibited him, he said, because, quote, if I like them, I don't want to practice before them the injury that I do to them in my work. I'd rather practice the injury in private, by which I think I can record the fact of them more clearly. Uh, Bacon liked working from pre-existing photographs, but he also commissioned photographs of, uh, from his friend and drinking companion, John Deacon. To create the psychological effect of having encountered them at random, he liked to work from them uh, after they'd been ripped or torn and allowed to settle like dead leaves uh, into the mulch of his studio floor. <laughs> Deacon's portrait photographs have the impact, said one friend, of a prison mugshot taken by a real artist. These were images, he said, to recoil from. Brutal portraits, intimate close-ups of the face, emphasizing every blemish. Now, like most modern artists, Bacon was convinced that he'd seen through what he saw as the lie of realism. And I'm talking about a particular you know, era of modernism, obviously. Uh, even the kind of sophisticated urban realism invented by Degas and Manet in the latter half of the 19th century. This is a, a favorite picture of mine in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston by Degas. Realism's pretense of disinterested truth-telling, its slavish fidelity to appearances, these things he believed were of dubious value in the more extreme 20th century. A conventional portrait could scarcely convey movement, let alone the whole gamut of psychological sensations, the human sense of mortality, the apprehension of futility, and of the nightmare of recent history, all those things that Bacon saw as fundamental to the modern condition, and therefore more real, in inverted commas, than appearances. He was, he was obsessed by the question of uh, how to communicate these things in paint. That's a, a money, by the way, of, of, of uh, Bert Morisot, the wonderful painter Bert Morisot, that's at RISD uh, in Providence. Uh, Bacon was obsessed by the question of how to communicate these things in paint. He spoke about distorting the image in an effect to bring about a greater sense of truth. He prefers, said his friend, the critic John Russell, uh, to bait the trap in such a way that conventional likeness at first seems excluded, <coughs> only to be caught unawares at a later stage. <coughs> Tell me, Bacon later asked Sylvester, who today has been able to record anything that comes across to us as fact without causing deep injury to the image? So Freud may have been influenced by this kind of talk, but he was still wedded to appearances. He remained adamant <coughs> that appearances were connected to truth, or at least that the, the effort to record them as faithfully as possible carried its own charge of truth. Uh, and it's something I happen to agree uh, with him about. Um, and it really was in this matter, the use of photography and the presence or otherwise of the sitter, that Freud put up his most strenuous resistance to Bacon's potentially overwhelming influence. For Freud, a great painting was always the record of a relationship in process. It was a transaction, as he later put it, uh, that could go on for months, even years. Duration was what enriched it. Yes, the painter was ultimately in control, but the process demanded shifting degrees of domination and yielding from both parties. In a culture of photography, he would later say, we've lost the tension that the sitter's power of censorship sets up in the painted portrait. What mattered to Freud about painting in the presence of a model was that the degree to which feelings, uh, sorry, not was that, but the, the, what mattered was the degree to which feelings can enter into the transaction from both sides. 
It wasn't until later that Freud articulated these instincts, but they were already at the core of his creative convictions. They were insights that he held close for years, and ones that he knew he shouldn't let go of. But he sensed in the way he acted on them a limitation. He had an, an inkling, a useful one as it turned out, that Bacon's more radical approach might hold the key to overcoming it. When uh, Freud convinced Bacon to sit for a small portrait, the idea uh, was to have the finished work uh, hang in Wheeler's, the Soho fish restaurant, where Bacon liked to hold court. Despite a great deal of turmoil in his life at the time, Bacon was willing. The process, as I said, took about three months. Not particularly long, as Freud later acknowledged. His later portraits could take a year or more. Nonetheless, it was a trial for Bacon, uh, who was temperamentally unsuited to posing. I can hardly sit down for long, he told Sylvester. It's one of the reasons I've suffered from my, uh, all my life from high blood pressure. People say, relax. What do they mean? I never understand this thing where people relax their muscles and they relax everything. I, I don't know how to do it. And this simmering volatility is, of course, exactly what Freud managed to get over in the finished portrait. But getting the thing done can't have been easy for either artist or sitter. Uh, it was no doubt disorienting uh, to both men that just as their own relationship reached a, maximum, a point of maximum intimacy and intensity, they found themselves embarking on amorous relationships that were to be the most important and the most destabilizing in each of their lives. Caroline Blackwood was the love of Freud's... Uh, this is not Caroline Blackwood, obviously, but that is. But this portrait I should have uh, had up a moment ago. It's, a, it's just an example of Freud's later work. It's a terrible reproduction, but it's a painting of his very close friend, uh, Frank Auerbach, who many of you may know is a wonderful British painter. Um, uh, at any rate, Caroline Blackwood uh, was the love of Freud's life. Strangely, however, and despite their five-year love affair, Freud conceded that Caroline remained to some extent impenetrable to him. It sounds ridiculous in a way, he told me, but I never really knew Caroline that well. Uh, Unlike as it sounds, the claim is in a strange way consistent. Freud cherished what was unknown and unknowable about people, even as he was constantly drawn to greater and greater extremes of intimacy. When you find something very moving, he once said, you almost want to know less about it. Rather like when falling in love, you don't want to meet the parents. <laughs> it's one of my, my favourite quotes. Um, <laughs> uh, Caroline's mother was... Uh, the brewery heiress, Maureen Guinness, you know Guinness here, I'm sure. Uh, um, she'd never met someone as exotic and dangerous seeming as Lucien or Ivana Lowell, a daughter by the British screenwriter Ivan Moffat. The fact that he was an outsider appealed to her, said Ivana, and she saw in him an entree into a more bohemian world. Freud and Blackwood had a year in Paris, then returned to London. They were considered the most alluring, enigmatic couple in town. Freud, at this stage, was beginning to succeed as an artist. Um, the two of them lunched in Soho every day with Bacon. And under the, spe the spell of Bacon's gusting sociability, life was rich and unpredictable. They acquired an old priory in Dorset. Freud, kept, who loved horses, kept horses there. He also kept a picture there by Bacon. Uh, it was based on Edward Moybridge's photographs of wrestlers, but it clearly showed two men making love on a bed. Uh, and it was a painting that Freud kept with him until his death. Uh, and though many requests came from museums, he never lent it up. Freud married Blackwood in 1953 when the divorce from Kitty came through. Uh, in 1954, they were again in Paris, but something was going wrong. It was a very cold winter in Paris that year. Uh, Blackwood, who was uh, prone to, to depression, had started to drink in earnest. Um, uh, she would later claim, uh, and probably correctly, that their marriage, uh, uh, that the main problem with their marriage was Freud's gambling. Um, Freud had started gambling under Bacon's influence. Uh, and in fact, his whole mentality through these years was infected by Bacon's devotion to leading a life of chance. When a mutual friend asked Bacon why her marriage to Freud had ended, she asked, have you ever driven with him? Uh, yes, replied the friend, and, and uh, I can attest to the reality of this. Uh, the friend said, I was so terrified that when he stopped at a red light for once, I threw myself out. <laughs> exactly, came Blackwood's reply. That was what being married to him was like. Uh, if there's such a thing as fault, Freud later said, uh, in, a, in a typically sly construction, then 
putting it mildly, it was completely my fault. Uh, it was Blackwood who left Freud rather than the other way around. Uh, she left uh, home one night and checked into a hotel. Freud was completely derailed by this. Um, nothing like this had happened to him before. Bacon was so concerned that he asked Charlie Lumley, a young Cockney neighbour who'd sat for Freud, to watch over him. Um, and he had to sort of babysit him for a while uh, because Bacon was afraid that he might commit suicide. <laughs> When I asked Freud why his friendship with Bacon had ended, he gave two separate accounts. One was the predictable sort of uh, falling out that can happen between friends who are also rivals. He, he said that uh, Bacon turned bitchy. He said um, uh, when Freud's own work started to do quite well. Uh, he said what, what he really minded was that I started getting rather high prices. Um, but Freud's other account uh, of what had gone wrong was more surprising. The same year that Freud fell in love with Blackwood, Bacon met the lover who would have the most lasting and really the most disastrous impact on his life. His name was Peter Lacey, and he was an ex-RAF Spitfire pilot who'd fought in the Battle of Britain. His nerves, Bacon later claimed, were shattered as a result. He was, quote, terribly neurotic, hysterical even. The whole relationship, he said, was the most total disaster from the start. Uh, being in love with someone in that extreme way, being totally physically <laughs> obsessed by someone, he said, is like having some dreadful disease. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Lacey's uh, vicious tantrums were violent in ways that Bacon could neither anticipate nor control, but this seems to have been why he was drawn to them. He yearned for forms of intimacy that involved exactly this kind of loss of control. Freud struggled to get to grips with Bacon's relationship. The more deranged and violent Lacey became, the more Bacon seemed to love him. Uh, and a crucial turning point came when Lacey, in one of his, his monstrous rages, threw Bacon through a window. Both men were drunk, which may have saved uh, Bacon. Um, sorry, no pun intended. Um, he, fe he, fell, uh, he fell 15 feet, uh, but survived. Um, his face, however, was so badly damaged that his right eye had to be, to be sewn back in place. When I saw Francis, Freud explains, one of his eyes was hanging out and he was covered in scars. I didn't really understand the relationship. After all, you don't. But I was so upset at seeing him like this that I got hold of Lacey's collar and twisted it around. Lacey, he claimed, was too much of a, of a gentleman, in inverted commas, to respond, and so the challenge fizzled out. The violence between them was a sexual thing, said Freud. I didn't really understand all this. The truth is, he told me, Francis really minded about this man more than anyone. Freud didn't talk to Bacon for three or four years after that. Uh, Bacon, it seems, had lost patience with his younger friend and seemed to consider him hopelessly naive. A similar inference, uh, an accusation of naivety, this time about his art, was there in his later complaints about Freud's work being realistic without being real. Now, before he met Bacon, Freud had shown plenty of talent, but in his art, as perhaps in his life, he was still prone to sentimentality and a kind of adolescent wish fulfillment. In the cauldron of his relationship with Blackwood, which ended in <coughs> bitter disappointment, and of his relationship with Bacon, uh, then embroiled in an amorous relationship so extreme that it, it burned away the fat of sentimentality, he learned, besides many artistic lessons, the appeal of extremity, obsession, and ruthlessness. Since before Kitty Freud's goal in portraiture had been to convey intimacy, he had figured uh, that a uniform and painstaking fidelity to appearances could be enough to convey utmost absorption in his subjects. But now he was not so sure. Swayed in part by Bacon, he began to pay increasing attention to his sitter's three-dimensional presence. Uh, he seemed especially interested in volumetric sort of idiosyncrasies, bunches of muscle, uh, pouches of fat, light reflecting oils on the skin, um, uh, and the viewer's consciousness of, a, of an overweening, romantic, and somewhat boyish style disappeared. But he was still unsatisfied. He only had to look at Bacon's work to realize he had to do more. My eyes, he said, were going completely mad, sitting down and not being able to move. Small brushes, fine canvas. Sitting down used to drive me more and more agitated. I felt I wanted to free myself from this way of working. And so, after his 1954 portrait of Caroline in Paris, he stood up to paint and never sat down again. The story of 
the development of Freud's work, his increasingly aggressive attack on sentimentality, which caused so many people to find his portraits cruel and ruthless, it is in many ways the story of his fight to keep this romantic susceptibility, this ingenuousness at bay. It's the story of a struggle not to suppress but to contain his most intense feelings, feelings that arose from intimate obsession and prolonged proximity. If Bacon's model, uh, uh, if Bacon was a model to emulate, it was also one to avoid. Um, uh, Freud put away his, his fine sable brushes and began to pay more attention to, um, uh, as I said, you know, conditions of skin almost, and, and the sense of flesh and bones and, and uh, uh, moving blood and, 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 and uh, sinew and all these things. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the Ecorche gallery I just saw here at the Academy. Um, he paid more and more attention to these, these uh, inward uh, things, less and less to surface tension. Um, he said, I think that Francis's way of painting uh, freely helped me feel more daring. Um, and the shift in his ensuing work was amazingly audacious. It was awkward at first, um, uh, in part because uh, he abandoned drawing completely. Um, uh, this thing that he'd made the, his reputation on, his talents as a draftsman and only worked with paint. He used thicker and thicker brushes and uh, hog's hair brushes and, and, and uh, uh, thick paint. And the ensuing results, as I say, were, were awkward, but um, gradually a sort of mature style arrived. Um, pitting himself against the cliche that the eyes are a window into the soul, he tended to paint his subjects either asleep or dead-eyed. He talked about treating the head as just another limb, and he lavished no more attention on his sitter's facial features uh, than on their thighs, their fingers, or their genitals. In this way, he undermined the whole tradition of portraiture as a function both of psychology and social status. Uh, instead, in his slow-moving hands, it became a function of intimate scrutiny, a scrutiny that, in, in Robert Hughes's phrase, uh, bypasses decorum while fiercely preserving respect. If the wanted poster Freud designed in an attempt to get his stolen portrait of Bacon back was a sort of joke, uh, and I think it was, the, the idea of Bacon as a, as a criminal at large, and a nod perhaps to Deacon's mugshots taken by a real artist. It was still an immensely poignant one. It was an admission that not just this riveting painting, but this man, this crucial relationship. Uh, and that's uh, where I'll end. Thank you so much for your attention. And, uh, <laughs>